jeepers you're listening to smash or pass hello everyone welcome back to another video on the jb and millie channel i am jb and joining me as always is rihanna hi and our special guest today is mark evanier and it's just amazing to have you here today and just going through all of your history and your your origins of things you've been many things throughout your career notably one of them is a prolific comic book writer do you recall what your first introduction to the world of comic books was uh when i was born the doctor slapped me and i dropped a copy of walt disney's comics and stories i've been reading comic books my whole life i learned to read from comic books and and as a result i skipped a couple of grades early on in school because i read so i was such good at reading and, and at nothing else but uh uh comic books have just been part of my life for, a, for as long as i can remember oh wow that's amazing and were there any specific comic book writers that you enjoyed growing up that you feel influenced your career well it's kind of interesting because when i was reading i started reading i was born in 1952 I started reading comic books about 55 or 56, and they almost none of them had credits at the time. So I didn't know who I was, whose work I was reading. Um, it was many years before I learned that some of the people, the writers I was reading, I was enjoying were men like Carl Barks and Don Christensen and uh, Lloyd Turner and Michael Maltese. I was reading mostly funny animal comic books back then. And as I got older, I got into superheroes and things like that. And I was became a, a big fan of a man named Jack Kirby. And I later became his assistant, which is amazing. One of the, one of the strange parts of my story is that in the 1970s, I was writing a lot of Hanna-Barbera comic books. And I was working with all the people, not all of them, but most of the people who had done the comic books I'd read when I was six years old. And in fact, I was, I was their boss in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that yeah. that's just like childhood dream like you you conquered all of your dreams and even more which is yeah. amazing and yeah you, know, you mentioned about how you started working on like the Hanna Barbara comics and touching on your time writing the gold key Scooby-Doo comics how did this come about well in 19 I think I'm not good at years here uh, because when you sometimes when you do the comic book it doesn't come out for a year so it's hard to the year that I wrote it is maybe not be the year it came out. Um, in uh, early 70s, I was working for Jack Kirby. There was a man named Mike Royer, who was Jack Kirby's inker. He worked with Jack on the artwork. And I got him that job, kind of. I convinced Jack to get rid of the guy he had before. And, and Mike said, well, you know, um, uh, You've been doing a wonderful favor for me, Mark. I'm going to introduce you to the people at the Disney Studios comic book department. Disney had a studio a department that did comic books that were only published overseas. Because after they translated all the comic books, the, the Disney comics that Gold Key published, the foreign publishers still wanted more. They wanted to publish more Mickey Mouse comic books in France than were published in the United States. So some stories and artwork were done just for the foreign market. And I was writing Disney comics for the foreign market and a man at the Disney Comics foreign department sent some of my work over to the a man named Chase Craig who was the editor of the American comic books and said hey you're looking for new writers this guy's really good and we, and we want to get rid of him <laughs> he, he's too prolific for us we he keeps submitting more stuff so I started writing the, the American Disney comic books and one day when I was in Chase Craig said to me hey you know, um, you, you don't just Disney comics. I need a new writer for the Scooby-Doo comic book. And I was at that point, not a huge fan of Scooby. I hadn't watched the show much. And I said, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And he said, it's being drawn by Dan Spiegel. Dan Spiegel was a comic book artist whose work I admired since I was a kid. He drew the Maverick comic books. He drew Space Family Robinson. He did a lot of the movie adaptations when they would take a live action Disney movie and put it into a comic book form. And I just thought he was one of the greatest comic book artists who ever lived. And I said, oh, if he's drawing Scooby-Doo, then I'll write it. And not only did we kind of click as a team, but Dan and I became friends and we began working together on other projects together. But that's how I did started doing the American Scooby-Doo comic books was Chase just put me together with Dan Spiegel. And we clicked and we did it until Gold Key lost the rights to it. Scooby. And then later we did Scooby-Doo again for other publishers. 
Hmm, that's very interesting. And like you say, um, a part of that, at least at the start, was adapting things. So turning what was Disney onto into print form. And in regards to Scooby, obviously you came up with original stories and everything, but a large part of that before was translating, I guess, episodes from TV to book so when you were making up your original stories did you ever refer back to the series at all to get the vibe or any like dialogue that was common well i the minute i was asked to do the comic book i read because i because i had most of them and, and got the rest all the the gold key comic books they'd done before me and i started watching the tv show and um i became kind of a fan of it uh you know, when, when Gold Key started doing a new comic book based on a TV show, they would usually do the first couple issues. They'd adapt episodes of the show because the studio, in this case, Hanna-Barbera, you know, had to kind of approve the material. And if they adapted a script from the TV show, the studio couldn't say, well, that's all wrong for Scooby-Doo because they adapted it. And then after about the second or third issue, the studio wouldn't bother looking at the comic books to approve them. So that they started doing original stories. So by the time I got to Scooby-Doo, we were doing original stories and I picked up on it. It was a pretty simple premise. Um, one of the things that I did in the gold key comic books, which I stopped doing in the uh, later on when Marvel published the uh, Scooby-Doo comic books is I gave him thought balloons. I had Scooby thinking things as if he was, talking the way Snoopy did in the, in the peanut strip. And I decided later that was a mistake. But it, it, the thing is, we were doing short stories in the Gold Key comic book. I think I had 12 or 13 pages. And for a Scooby-Doo story, you have to interview, introduce the ghost. You have to inter introduce three or four people who could be the ghost as suspects. You have to have the problem solved. You have to have Fred or someone explain how the trick was done. And it's tough to get all that information into 12 or 13 pages. So by having Scooby do these thought balloons, he could convey some information that it, saved, it, it was a matter of condensing action down. So well, that makes complete sense. And like you say, with the kind of studio and everything, not really paying attention to the comic books for, in terms of approval and writing off on things. Now, the Scooby community can be quite unforgiving and challenging when it comes to whenever something's changed or altered, even if it's the most minute thing. So from just a point of view of what not to do, did you ever have any like pushback on you can't do this for a storyline or the, a character can't behave this way or were you given quite a lot of creative freedom? Well, when I did the comic books in the 70s, I didn't hear from any of the fans because there was no internet at that point. Um, the only feedback I got was from Chase Craig, my editor. And the only feedback he got was from the people of the studio. And the people of the studio weren't really looking at the comic books, except occasionally to take ideas from them. Mm. A couple of the episodes of the TV show were kind of lifted from stories I'd done in the comic book. Because at some point in the history of Scooby-Doo, the writers got desperate for ideas. They'd done so many of them. Um, when I wrote for Scooby-Doo in the late, well, the, the year starting with the year Scrappy came in, um, the way you'd write, a, write an episode of Scooby-Doo is you'd go to the editor or the story, the, the producer or the story editor, you'd say something like, uh, what if there's a haunted ant farm with a ghost ant around? And the, and the guy would take a list He'd have like a big thing here. He'd say, oh, um, we did that in season six. We did that in season three, <laughs> whatever. So you'd go in with all these ideas and you piss this one. They go, no, we've done it. This one, no, they've done it. And if you came up with one that they'd never done before, um, they would do the episode. I went in one time and I named like about eight ideas and they, they turned them all down. And I said, how about an episode where there's a haunted baseball player. We have a baseball diamond and there's haunted ghosts going around the, the diamond. And the guy went, oh, I'm sure we've done that one. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, we did that in, uh, well, maybe it's over here on this one here. Uh, we did that on season, can it be? We've never done that before. And they called somebody else in the building and they said, no, we never did it before. So that's how I got that assignment. Um, and, uh, you know, you, 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 you have to somehow come up with a variation each time. The trick with the Scooby-Doo episode was it's got to be, it's got to have all the familiar elements. 
the fans would like to see, you know, Scooby and, Scra uh, and Shaggy fighting over food. They'd like to see Scooby and Shaggy running and terror of thing. They'd like to see, you know, there's certain conventions of the show, which it's gotten broader since I did it. It was a little repetitive at times back then. Um, you know, after I got off it, they opened the thing up to the possibility that some of the ghosts and monsters were real. When I did it, the ghosts were all fake. Um, but, uh, you know, you just had to come up with something funny to do that would lend itself to a story that could be done in, I think an episode at that point was like 19 minutes after you got the commercials out of it. So, and A lot of the things that they then went on to do is, in subsequent series, they got rid of characters like Fred, Daphne, and Velma. And like you say, with the comic books being quite restricted in terms of pages, did you ever wish that you could get rid of any characters so it was more focusing well, on Shaggy and Scooby? I, I, I felt it was not my job to get rid of characters because my job was to match the show that was current at the time. Um, keep in mind that there's a lead time on these things. When a, a Scooby -Doo, new Scooby-Doo episode would appear on TV, um, it would be you know, written months before it aired, and I would be doing stuff months before the, pub, the comic came out. So I was basically inter, it, it always guided by what was on the air. I didn't do that many episodes of the TV show. I was mostly doing the comic book, and the comic book, I just went along and, you know, and I waited to see if anybody would stop me, and they didn't. I think one of the problems was that nobody was nobody in the in the building was reading them. You know, they they just didn't. There was so many things going on at Hanna Barbera. I had an office at Hanna Barbera from about 1976 to about 1983, I think. And I would go in two days a week. I didn't. I wasn't. I was not never full time for the studio. And I'd be in, and I, you know. Wouldn't hear much of what was going on. <laughs> I just do my episodes. I, I did other shows for them besides Scooby Doo. I did Richie Rich for a long time for them. You know, the whole process of it, it, it sounds amazing and very complicated as well because just to finish one, you have to move on to the next one. But, you know, now the Gold Key books are one of basically in the Scooby community, one of the most sought after items for Scooby Doo collectors. I mean, myself, I've been trying to get hold of one for so long and I found it really hard so I was wondering did you manage to get hold of any of the Scooby books that you wrote oh yeah yeah I got I got all the issues I wrote I got actually I had all the issues someplace somewhere in this house there is every issue of the gold key Scooby-Doo comic book um, and uh, and I knew a lot of the people who did them um, before Dan Spiegel the artist was a man named Warren Tufts who I knew a little bit. And before him, it was a man named Jack Manning, who I worked with on a lot of comic books. And before him, it was a man named Phil Dallara, who I worked with on a lot of comics. And I knew some of the writers too. It's, it's hard to identify the writers because the art, you can look at an art style, and recognize it, but the writer's work is a little more difficult to figure out. But, um, you know, no, I, I was, a, I admired the comic books. They were well done. Um, Chase was the editor of all of them, I think. And he, knew how to, he was a good, very good editor. I have had some very good editors in my lifetime and a few that I felt should be dangled out a window. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm so glad that, you know, you got to have them and you still have them to this day. And I was wondering, do you remember, because we touched on it earlier, how Scooby Comics transitioned to being published by Marvel. Do you remember what caused this tra transition yeah, to happen? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what happened. And oddly enough, uh, I was in the middle of this stuff. Um, what, there was a tremendous, in the 70s, there was a tremendous market for what I was describing earlier about Disney doing foreign comics. Uh, Hanna-Barbera comics were published all over the world. And, and there were Hanna-Barbera TV shows were syndicated all over the world and they didn't quite match. They didn't, they didn't, um, you know, uh, for instance, Jabberjaw was on here in this country one year and then it was on other, in other countries eight years later. And the other country wanted to do Jabberjaw comic books at a time when America didn't because the TV show was off. And Hanna-Barbera kept pressing Gold Key, which was a, basically a company called Western Publishing Company was the parent company to do more Hanna-Barbera comics. Uh, in around 72 or so when I was doing Scooby-Doo, they were publishing Scooby-Doo. They were publishing, I think, 
the Harlem Globetrotters. I think they were publishing Funky Fandom. They were publishing about six different comic books based on Hanna-Barbera properties, but they weren't doing the Flintstones. They weren't doing uh, Yogi Bear. They weren't doing Huckleberry Hound. They weren't doing, you know, and, and the people at Hanna-Barbera, the parent company of it that was trying to make as much money as possible, went to Western and said, look, you should put out a Flintstones comic and a Yogi Bear comic book and a Dynamite comic book and a, you know, and, and you know, there's, there's 80 comic books you could be publishing. And Western said, we don't think we can make money in this marketplace with 80 comic books, just with these five or so. And, um, you know, they wanted very, so Hanna-Barbera wanted very much to have a lot of Hanna-Barbera comic books out. And since Gold Key wouldn't do it, they got an offer from a company called Charlton, which is based in Connecticut here. And said, oh, we, we'll publish them. If, you, if, Hanna, if Gold Key won't give you a line of 20 Hanna-Barbera comics, we will. So uh, Hanna-Barbera took the rights away from Gold Key and gave them to Charlton. And they put out, I don't know if you've ever seen the Charlton books, they put out a whole bunch of them. And the foreign publishers didn't like them and didn't want to buy the reprint rights to those stories. So the uh, people at Hanna-Barbera, you know, went, oh, oh, we're not, this is not working. <laughs> we're in trouble now. And they finally decided that when Charlton's contract expired, they would take the rights away from them. They would not let them renew the contract. And Hanna-Barbera was going to publish the comics themselves, start a business called Hanna-Barbera Comics that would publish all the comics they wanted. And they discovered that in 1975, now roughly the time we're speaking, you couldn't start a comic book company. Even if you were Hanna-Barbera with all their money and all their famous properties, newsstand distri distribution was very rigidly controlled by the publishers already there, DC, Marvel, Harvey. They didn't want a new competitor in the marketplace. And they wouldn't let them in. And finally, Marvel came in and offered to them and said, um, if you want to really put Yogi Bear and Scooby-Doo comic books out, we will publish them, but we won't let you be a publisher. So Hanna-Barbera made a deal that they hired Chase Craig, the same guy I mentioned before, who had retired from Gold Key. They hired him to come out of retirement and edit a line of four comic books for them to start. And it would be four bi-monthlies, uh, The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, Scooby-Doo, and Dynamite. And uh, this is a strange coincidence in my life, but my life has a lot of strange coincidences in it. I was writing a TV show. I wasn't doing comic books at the time. I was writing a TV show you may have heard of called Welcome Back, Cotter, which was on ABC television. And the day we finished the season, I decided I wasn't going to come back for another year. It was a very rough job, a very demanding job. I didn't want to do it. So I woke up the next morning and my girlfriend was a, an actress on the show. She played one of the classroom people. So I was out of work and she was out of work for a while because they weren't going to make any more Welcome Back Cotters for six months. And she said to me, uh, so what about out of work? Um, if you could have any job in the world, what would you like? And I said, that's too difficult. To, there's so many things I want to do. She said, well, if you could get back any job you used to have, um, what would that be? And I said, and I, and I don't know what I would have answered if she'd asked me five minutes later, but the first thing that came to my head was, you know, I loved writing the Scooby-Doo comic book for Gold Key when Chase Craig was the editor and Dan Spiegel was the artist. I loved working with Chase and I loved working with Dan and I loved drawing that, writing that comic. And so she says, well, why don't you go back and see if you can get that job again? And I said, well, Gold Key no longer publishes Scooby-Doo. It's done by this company called Charlton that does terrible work and pays terribly. You know, you pay your artists and writers small enough amounts of money, you're not going to get great stories and art. And I said, and Chase is retired, and Dan Spiegel is now working for other publishers. So I can't get, you know, Scooby-Doo, and I can't get Chase Craig, and I can't get Dan Spiegel. So she said, okay, let's talk about something more important. Where am I going to get a job? Well, about 15, 20 minutes later, my phone rings, and it's Chase Craig calling me. And he says, I've come out of retirement to run a, a division for Hanna-Barbera that's going to generate some stories. And uh, we're doing some four comic books, and I got Dan Spiegel to agree to, to do the art, draw the Scooby-Doo comic book, if you will write it. And I said, uh, 
really? He says, yeah, I, I, you know, Dan would like to work with you again. And he says, he won't draw it unless you write it. So I said, well, what are you paying? And he told me, and I said, well, what are the other four comic books? He says, we're doing the Flintstones, Yogi Bear and Dynamite. And I said, well, who's writing and drawing those? And he says, nobody, this is my first day. I haven't hired, Dan was my first hire. And I said, okay, I'll write Scooby-Doo if you let me write the other three also. And he said, you got them. Let's have lunch today. So I went out and I had lunch with Chase Craig at the Hanna-Barbera Studios. And I went home that day and I started writing a Scooby-Doo comic book. And that was, you know, one of those strange coincidences. And I, you know, I told Christine, you know, later on what would happen. She said, you told me you couldn't get that job back. I said, I didn't think I could. It, it reformed itself somewhere else. So, um, we did these four issues, uh, these four comic books for a few months. I, and at some point, Chase decided he didn't want to work so hard. So he made me the editor of the, of the division. He went back to retirement. And some people at Marvel didn't change their mind. They said, we don't want to be publishing characters we don't own. So we canceled the, the, they canceled the Hanna-Barbera line. But we still continued to, by that point, we were also doing them for the foreign market. So for about six years, I edited a line of comics that were only published overseas of various Hanna-Barbera characters keyed to what the, that particular country was showing. In other words, when, when uh, Mumbly was on in Switzerland, Switzerland would buy Mumbly stories. So we do Mumbly stories. And when, when, they, were, when they were airing, uh, you know, Shake, Rattle and Roll in Peru, Peru wanted Shake, Rattle and Roll stories. So we did Shake, Rattle and Roll stories. And, 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 and everybody was running Scooby-Doo. So we did a lot of Scooby-Doo stories that were never published in this country, which I didn't write most of those. Uh, although Dan Spiegel drew, drew quite a few of them. Uh, I was editing those lines. But um, so Hanna, the rights for the Hanna-Barbera stuff went from Western Publishing, Gold Key, to Charlton, to Marvel. And, but, but the Marvel books were not edited by Marvel. Marvel had nothing to do with the contents. We did them out of the studio in, in Los Angeles. And then I think Archie got the rights later and other people. And, it went, and a couple of times in that, that people would come to me and say, hey, you, you and Dan want to do some Scooby-Doo stories for us. So that's kind of how it worked. Wow, it's so interesting to hear the like almost the the vicious monopoly that places like you know companies like Marvel and DC have and had on on comic books and almost looking you know now in 2022 the monopoly that Marvel now again has in the theaters and the cinema and everything is it's very interesting to see how that all played out and for all you said that Marvel wasn't really hands on in terms of the Scooby things that was kind of done in house so to speak. Did your attitude change from writing for Gold Key versus Marvel, considering that they were quite different yeah. in terms of ethos of the company? Yeah, well, well the, the company had nothing to do with it. The, the Marvel had no input. Marvel had no influence at all. They just printed the thing and paid us. Uh, but several years later, I had changed. And also, the fact that I was editing them out of this Hanna-Barbera building. I had an office in Hanna-Barbera. Joe Barbera is walking through the halls, oh. you know. Uh, and I just felt I should be closer to the show. There was one day when I came in to my office and someone, a man was using the phone and he was embarrassed. He had just picked up a, you know, he needed a phone and he picked it up and, I, and he apologized to me. And I said, no, no, go ahead and, you know, use the phone because he seemed to be in, in worried. And he was, he was talking to his wife because there was, a, he lived in Santa Barbara, which is a town about two hours north of of uh, Los Angeles and there was a big fire in the hills and he was telling his wife it, the, how, the fire was not yet threatening their area but he was telling his wife why don't you put these things in the car in case we have to evacuate and as he was talking I my brain went and I went that's Ranger Smith from the Yogi Bear show I recognized his voice it was Don Messick it, mm -hmm. otherwise known as the voice of Scooby-Doo and I got to meet Don on a number of occasions and go in and watch him record shows. And I worked with him a few other times. And the fact that I was now integrated into the core of the show, and I was hanging out with people who worked on the show. And, you know, I was in the building where the shows were being made. Um, and I knew, all, and, and then they, people on them were asking me to write stuff for them. So I became more part of Hanna-Barbera and that changed the contents of the comic books a bit. Wow. That's amazing how you've interacted with 
you know, within that building, so many people. And I believe that through research, I found out that that's something that you did is identifying the the voices, you know, the voice actors and things. And yeah. I just think that that's so difficult from my perspective. I think the only voice actor that I can probably recognize is either Frank Welker or Bob Bergen and things. I couldn't imagine. Well, it's, 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 hard, it's, it's hard to recognize Frank Welker all the time because some of his voices... Oh. Do not sound at all like Frank Welker. Um, there was a time when I would come home from a date and I'd play back my voicemail and my date would hear that I left had a message from Sean Connery. And then the next message would be from uh, uh, Bill Cosby. And the next message would be from, and I'd realize they're all Frank Welker doing impressions. They're all Frank imitating people. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're, not for, they're not really the people. Um, I've known Frank for quite a few years, and he's just one of the nicest, sweetest men in the world. And he can sound like anybody or anything. I mean, it's it's you know, I mean, it, 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 I had a guy come up to me once at a comic convention. And he says, "Gee, I'm so tired of hearing Frank Welker on that special. It seems like you did that special, and Frank was doing four characters in it. And I recognized every one of them. And I said, "You said he did four? He said, "I said, "Yeah, he did nine." <laughs> you know, he didn't recognize the other five so um you know he's just but um i was a fan of cartoon voice actors when i was a kid i was aware that the voice of the prince in the fractured fairy tales on the rocky and his friends show was the same guy who was doing huckleberry hound over on huckleberry hound show and then he was also doing yogi bear and he was doing mr jinx and don messick was doing pixie the mouse and the ranger and a lot of the announcers and extra characters and i got to learn these people's voices and i got to work with them all it's very it's very thrilling to me that you know i went from sitting there watching you know rocky and bullwinkle when i was seven or whatever i was to working with the people who were the voices of rocky and bullwinkle and i actually even worked on some rocky and bullwinkle projects but um it's you know it's just it's like you know, the other side of the looking glass, it's like Alice in Wonderland. Suddenly you're on the other side of the mirror and everything is different, but it's familiar too, because you reckon, I, I would sit and have lunch with Dawes Butler and I get mesmerized by the fact that that voice was coming out of a human being. You know, you just go, it's one thing if it's coming out of your TV set, but it's coming out of a person who's sitting there, you know, asking for more ketchup. It's, uh, Rather amazing. Uh, Daw, you know, Dawes was the voice of Snagglepuss. You know, you know Snagglepuss. And uh, he and I were at a restaurant one time waiting for a table. And the people ahead of us had no idea who Dawes was because, you know, when he, when he was in front of a microphone, he looked like a very, a very short, little, nice little man. And the lady seating us, seating people said to the people ahead of us, your table's this way. And this guy in the group and having no idea who he was near does this bad snagglepuss impression. And he goes, eggs at stage right into the dining room. And Dawes heard that. And he turns to me and suddenly the authentic voice of snagglepuss is saying to me, heavens to plagiarism. <laughs> you know? And uh, it's kind of amazing to, to, to deal with these people. You know, I, um, by the time this airs, well, you broadcast with this thing on the internet, um, we will have done, you, you know, this will be, I will have been to the comic convention in San Diego and I run these cartoon voice panels there with, with voice actors. And over the years, I had a lot of like people like June Ferre and, and, and Howie Morris and uh, uh, Lucille Bliss, a lot of voice people. Um, you know, I, I, I was going to have this year, but he's not going to be able to work his schedule. I was going to have Alan Oppenheimer on the sh uh, as on the panel alan is been around a long time he's works all the time and if you watch a scooby-doo show and you know who alan o recognize alan oppenheimer's voice if one of the suspects is out played by alan oppenheimer he's probably the one that did it <laughs> because he, he plays villains so good and, and such and uh uh you know i got to work with lots, lots of these folks and they're all lovely people and they can all sound magic like like 15 different people. And they can all sound like like you know penguins and ducks. And it's amazing. It really is. And I just didn't understand how talented some of these people truly were until starting this series. Like as you were, you know, 
relaying that story there I was just thinking back to when we spoke with Bob Berg and on one second yes. he'd just be like in like the same breath he'd be himself and then he'd transition to Porky Pig and then you'd get Bucky the Squirrel without like like it was nothing it would just be it was stuff it's crazy Dawes Butler would tell me stories and without realizing it, he'd lapse into the people doing them. He'd tell a story about working with mm -hmm. Joe Barbera and he'd be telling something, doing a Joe Barbera impression. And, oh. and he, he wasn't even aware he was doing it sometimes. But, you know, Bob Bergen is an, is an example of an amazing talent. He's, he's one of those people who, like me, sat there watching cartoons and turned it into a career. And you know, he, he's, he's actually one of the smartest, in addition to being very talented, he's one of the smartest guys in the business, understanding, he's very realistic. If you, if you want to become a voice actor, you've got to listen to everything Bob Bergen ever said on online or read, everything he ever posted, because he really knows, understands the business very realistically. You have to be very pragmatic and really understand the truth of it, not imagine, oh, I wish the business was like this. You've got to, you've got to understand how the business really works. And uh, he's had a great career. Uh, who else have you had on on the show from voice people? Well, in terms of voiceover artists, we had David Kay on recently. Oh, David oh. Kay. We hear David Kay on. Ooh, uh, yeah. do, you get a, do you get a show over there called uh, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver? I think we do, yeah. yeah I think we have David, to link on to like, the networks and stuff. Yeah, so. David's the announcer on that show, yeah. Oh. And uh, yeah, there's all... So Wonderful, the talented someone people. who you may know from your time working on Garfield is we had Audrey Wazalewski on. Audrey, it's fabulous. Audrey was was on the show a lot. Yeah, Audrey. Uh, yeah, Audrey was uh, uh, played uh, Garfield's girlfriend, who Arlene, and and other voices. You know, we have we have her there. We have she was she does the amazing little boys. She does the best little boys, and 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 we have her a lot. Yeah, Audrey was fabulous. Um, uh, she still is. Uh, you know, you, you, there's a lot of talent out there. And it's, it's more so now than ever because, you know, nowadays, which was not true years ago, you can build your own recording studio in your garage with internet material and computers and such. You can edit things. It used to be it cost a fortune to edit audio. And now you can do it at home for, for nothing. Uh, and so every, even before we had the COVID, the pandemic that forced people to start working at home, an awful lot of, of recording people had spent the money to get uh, microphones and, and, you know, all the equipment, the hard, hard material they need to do that. And so it's developed a lot of great new actors. I'm going to have some of them on the panel that well, I, have done, I will have done by the time you post this on the internet. Oh, that's amazing. Definitely, like us being from the UK, it's quite rare to have a lot of the voice actors come over here for Comic Cons and stuff. It's kind of a shame. Like, I was like this close to meeting Frank Welker in Scotland last year, and then yeah. it was cancelled like a week before the event because of COVID restrictions in Scotland. Yeah, changing. Yeah. So it's unfortunate, but you know, fingers crossed one day. And of course, you know, the San Diego Comic Con is just, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to, to go to something like that. One time, I was driving uh, someplace and I was, I was uh, late getting to the meeting. So I had to grab something to eat. So I pulled into a McDonald's drive through and I'm, well, I ordered as I'm ordering, I look at the rear view mirror and the car behind me has Frank Welker in it. He's, he's in the McDonald's drive through and, uh, and he doesn't know it's me. He doesn't recognize that he's on a car ahead. So I pull up to the window to pay and I say, I'd like to pay for the person behind me. And, and when he comes up to pay, just tell him it's free if he will imitate a bunch of ducks for you. And so they I paid for Frank's, they drove off, and he pulls up and he says to them, uh, how much I owe you? And they go, no, it's free if you make a bunch of duck sounds. <laughs> so, uh, no, he's a, he's a lovely man. He's hard to meet because he doesn't go a lot of places. He's very humble. He's too damn shy for his own good. Uh, I know lots of people who who want to be you know, friends with Frank or meet him at least. And it's, it's very rare that he does that type of thing. Uh, but stick with it. Eventually you'll meet him and uh, um, ask him, if, if you do see ever see him, ask him about the time he stole Mark Evanier's car keys. He stole my car keys once. I won't, I, won't, I won't tell you the story, but he'll tell you. Too. Yeah, I'll definitely okay. make a note of that. I think he's in the process of getting reconfirmed to, I think it's Edinburgh in October. So 
Fingers yeah. crossed that that works out. Basically, yeah, and he's not going for the convention. He's going for the golf courses. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, he'll do he'll do the convention if it's near a golf course. I think is the way it works. So so basically, if we want to meet Frank, we just need to hang out at a bunch of golf courses. Of golf. Yeah. Can pray that- yeah, if you could, if you could learn to caddy, that might help a little bit. But no, he's you know. Um, uh, He's got a private life. All these people do. You got to remember sometime that they're not your property, that they're just people who are there to entertain you and they get to control access. And, you know, I, I've done work with a lot of very big stars. And sometimes, you know, so if someone's on television, they might just be getting 4,000 letters, fan letters a week. Well, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with 4,000 people each week who want to be your buddy? It's tough. And sometimes they have to put up walls and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend all of my life yeah. answering my fan mail or sending out autographs. So they do little limits. They say, I'll go to this convention and I'll be four hours there. I'll give, I'll give you, you know, um, you know, you shouldn't get frustrated if you can't meet these people and be their friends because so many people want that. And some of the people, frankly, are a little pushy and a little intrusive. You know, they don't want to just shake your hand. They want to know all about you yeah. and come to your house and look in your look in your underwear drawer and things like that. <laughs> so, um, but uh, if you get to meet Frank, he will not disappoint you. Oh my gosh, I completely understand what you mean yeah. about stuff like that, and it, it's something that makes me cringe personally. Just think, and I know a lot of you know voice actors don't mind this, but when say they're on a, a podcast and the host is like, "Can you please do this voice?" or "Can you please do that voice?" and it's kind of like I know a lot of them don't mind, but it's something that we definitely make sure to never do. You know, if they volunteer a voice, then that's fantastic. If not, then let it be because it's like obviously we've got you on here today, an incredibly talented writer. But we wouldn't go, oh, can you write this for us? Can you write well, that for us? You know? Well, you know, you know, the thing is, with someone like, uh, and let's leave Frank aside because he's kind of in a category by himself. Um, someone who's a vo- an actor, a lot of the people who are voice actors get annoyed. Annoyed is too strong a word, maybe. That people forget they do other things. A lot of these people have, have had very big careers on the stage, doing plays, have, have, have done TV, have, have done other entertainment things and voice acting is just one thing they do and the thing is if you work a lot and this is the thing that's uh interesting here if you work a lot um sometimes the job you did in a cartoon show was 20 minutes out of your life 18 years ago you don't remember them all because someone like now get back to frank for a second there was a point when frank was running around doing like four or five shows a day different studios and such and even if and someone like Bob Bergen, in the course of a day, he may do 12 auditions and six shows. And, and it's not just cartoon shows. He's doing voiceover for commercials. He's doing audio books. He's doing dubbing for movies. He's doing uh, promos, announcements, trailers. And so what happens sometimes is, you know, these people come to my panel at Comic-Con and I asked, and I actually asked them, you know, demonstrate the most famous voices of yours and they blank out they've got to literally go to imdb and look themselves up and think what have they done and someone will come up to them and say hey i love that uh um um uh, stammering penguin that you did on this show and they don't remember ever doing that show it was eight years ago i mean it was two it was two weeks ago on your tv but it was eight years ago for them in the recording studio and they don't remember it and they don't want to disappoint you and they get you know, you got to just give them, the, cut them the slack that they are not, you know, robotic voice machines. They're human beings and they don't remember everything they've done. They don't remember the voices. We always have, when we're recording, when I'm directing voices, we have a, what we call a reference tape for every character. When we set a voice, we record a bunch of dialogue just for ourselves. And so I can play this back to the actor if he has to do that character again nine months later or, or, or even two weeks later. A couple times in the middle of the session, I will stop and I'll say to an actor, you know, you're, 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 you're straying from the voice. You're losing the voice. We'll, we'll play the reference tape for you again. And they go, oh, yeah, you're right. I, that's, I've lost. Uh, Mel Blanc in his later days was a w- lovely man. He was one of the greatest voice people who ever lived. He practically invented 
the whole business of cartoon voices. But in his last few years, you know, Mellon had a very famous accident, which which had shut, had done much damage to his body and his, you know, and, and to himself. And he would, when he was doing like a Flintstones late in life. They had to keep stopping and reminding, playing the reference tape to Barney Rubble because the voice would stray. He had so he was so versatile that it was very easy for him to slip from doing Barney Rubble into a higher pitched Barney Rubble or a lower Barney Rubble or whatever. It, it was easier for like guys like Lorenzo Music who only had the one voice. Everything Lorenzo said sounded like Garfield because Lorenzo only had one voice, but Mel had you know hundreds and hundreds, so it was easy to slip away. And and you know with someone like Frank Welker. Um, you got to remind him what the character sounded like and maybe, you know, play the reference tape from every 15 minutes during the recording session in case he starts straying from it. I mean, hearing all of those voices like play to such perfection is a reason why I even now go back to shows like the, the Laugh Olympics, because on one hand, you've got Dick Dastardly, Mustard, like, uh, Mutley and Scooby and... And all of them, and it's definitely a show that I revisit, even just for study in, in quite a lot of situations. And, you know, I believe that you did write a lot of the Laugh Olympic books. Was that because I wrote, of... I, I, was, I was the editor and writer of all the Laugh Olympic comic books. Was that, that, that because that of our love for the, for the characters? Or no, the, actually, what happened was them? that I, was, I had the job of running the Hanna-Barbera comic book department. And they called up one day and said, we want to have a, the business guys decided there should be a, a monthly Laugh Olympics comic book. And they said, we need the first issue in about eight weeks or six. No, it was less than that. It was like three weeks. So I had to go to, you know, and, and I wrote most of those comics myself because that's, that was the part of the job I liked. Being the editor was not as much fun as writing them. And also I grew up with Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound and Snagglepuss. Those were childhood favorites. And here was a chance to now put them on paper and write them because I heard their voices in my head. I heard Dawes Butler's voices. So I wrote the comics and I, and I chose the artists and supervised the production, but I was doing it because it was a fun job. That was all. And I, and I, and I got the, I got the money that way. <laughs> Love Olympics comics. Like they definitely hold a very special place in our hearts. And, you know, would you say that you had a favorite, or maybe a Scooby comic or a couple of comics that you felt really proud of or were your favorites? Um, I liked all of them. Um, I wrote a story about a haunted riverboat one time that I liked a lot. I remember that one. I remember a couple of others. You know, uh, actually, uh, I did a, uh, a special. I don't know if you ever saw it. They came to Chase Craig and myself one day and they said, um, Marvel wants to put out a tabloid size, extra large uh, Christmas, Flintstones Christmas story book. And they need it like in three weeks, 48 pages. <laughs> um, and it was like the hottest day in July. It was a Christmas comic. And I had to write 48 pages in two days in July when it was 102 here. And it sold so well that we did a, Yogi Bear Easter one. And then we did a Laugh Olympics one, which I did by myself because Chase had retired by that point. And I really loved that. So it was called The Man Who Stole Tuesdays or my Monday. I forget what it was. It was about a day of the week going missing. And uh, uh, I wrote that thing. And again, I had like one day to write it or two days to write it. And I just really liked that story. It was a Laugh Olympics, not a Scooby Doo, but Scooby was in it. And, uh, you know, it, it's. It was fun to, because nobody was supervising me. I mean, I just wrote it and it was drawn and we sent it to press and nobody had to approve it. Nobody had to say, gee, that's a stupid idea, Veneer. Um, and sometimes it's fun to work that way. It's like a, it's like a, a daredevil per performing without a net. If you, if you screw up, you, you break your ankle, you know. That's really interesting. and. I guess going back a little bit to talking about San Diego Comic-Con, you go quite often, you mentioned that you're going this year. Have you ever been asked to sign any Scooby-Doo items? Yeah, oh, yes. Plenty of them. Yes. Yeah. I've been going to uh, San Diego conventions since 1970 when the first one happened. I've been to every one they've had in, in the summer with multi-day conventions. Um, I'm one of, I think, five people who've been to every one of them. 
And I've seen the convention grow from 300 people in the whole convention to 300 people are heading in line to buy a diet Snapple. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I have people bring up Laugh Olympics and Scooby-Doo comic books a lot. I did a Space Ghost special once that I have, I, they told me they printed like 150,000 of them. And I think I've signed 200,000. I don't understand how that works. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's autographed all the time. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's very gratifying, um, especially when the people who want them signed are not just dealers trying to enhance the value of the comics. Uh, that's definitely true. Cause there's some people who I feel go into things for the wrong reasons and instead of just doing it for the love of the item and for their own personal, I, I can't, I, I can't remember the word, sorry. <laughs> um, like for their own personal like collection, they then just do it to sell it on eBay for extortionate amounts that no well, one can afford. You know, it's silly to, that I have a problem. I, I I I wish the business belonged only to the people who love it, but no business is due. There's no business in the world that people aren't in primarily to make the money, even if it's just money to make the money to feed their families and buy groceries. And the business operates around creative people but it also operates around business people the creative people have to get paid by the business people so so you, you know you don't begrudge them that when they start you know charging a lot that in some cases the fault of all the different people who love it who are fighting to get copies you know the scarcity drives it up it's not the fact that the that the comic is worth is really worth twenty dollars it's the fact that there's 35 people bidding for it that drives the price up. So it's it's the price is is frequently uh, raised not by the mercenary seller but by all these buyers competing with each other. Yeah. That's Especially very... in the era of like grading now, where like you can like yeah. have people grading comic books on like if there's like a tear on a certain page or I guess autofication because I do like collecting autographs. And I kind of think to myself, I know that I'm never going to sell, sell any of it. So why did I opt to get it authenticated as well? And it's kind of like, it, well, it, 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 it feel bad in a way. Well, first of all, today you say, I'll never sell it. Mm -hmm. I have friends who said yeah. that 30 years ago and now they're broke or they need money for good reasons. I mean, I mean, I had, I had a girlfriend who died of cancer a couple of years ago, and I had to do a few things I didn't want to do to raise money, to, because it was very expensive. Um, you know the treatments you went under, uh, and you know you can't predict exactly how you're going to feel about that stuff in 30 years. There might become a point when somebody offers you money for it, and the money is so tempting, you think, well, you know, if, and if you, if you don't think it was money, you think you know somebody said says, uh, you know, um, if you'd sell me all those books you own, we'll give you this. And that's enough money for you to put the down payment on a house, the house you want. Mm -hmm. And and if you have a family, you might think, you know, that's, you know, money is, is you know, can, can, can mean a lot of things. You can do very wonderful things with money um, and, and, and rotten things as well, as we all know. So you might say, well, you know, the greater good here would be for me to have a good house for my family. The greater good for me would be to get out of debt and, this and you might decide to sell them or at some point you might you know when you die you might leave them to someone who will need the money to sell you would like probably your heirs to be taken care of so you know it doesn't I, I sign the stuff for people all the time I just I just like signing it more for the people who've read the book I mean that's very true, and I, you know, thank you for for sharing uh, that kind of personal detail with us because it is. It, it, I guess it is always easy to, to forget about about when things can get serious of situations like that. And I guess every sign thing, if you are selling it in service of helping a loved one or just aiding yourself in what you need, I guess sign things. If you think about things realistically, maybe in five, ten years, you can buy that back as well. So, you know, I guess material things are there, but, you know, I guess real life is, is kind of always changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, my final question about, like, conventions in Comic-Con, do you have a favourite 
interaction with a fan or maybe what's some of your favorite aspects of attending like San Diego Comic Cons? Well, the early San Diego Cons uh, and not just the San Diego ones, but other conventions I went to like in New York and such, I got to meet a lot of people whose work I'd admired. I got to meet, you know, again, we're talking about back to our old topic about interacting with people whose work you loved when you were eight years old. I got to meet a lot of the people who made TV shows or cartoons or comic books I loved when I was eight or 10 years old. And that was my favorite part of going to conventions. Now I'm 70 years old. The people who did the comic books that when I was a kid, either I've met them or they've died. There, I don't, there's no one out there who I could conceivably meet who would have the thrill of meeting Carl Barks or meeting uh, Steve Ditko or meeting Jack Kirby for the first time, anything like that. Or in the same with the cartoons, meeting Dawes Butler was one of the most wonderful things in my life. And and Don Messick and Stan Freeberg and June Ferre and things like that. Um, so that was what I loved about conventions. What I love about conventions these days is they let me do a lot of panels, which is fun to do. I run around. I have a schedule here for the convention, which again, I will have ha passed by the time this thing is on the internet, but I've got all these things I'm doing all day. I got them color coded <laughs> to, to go to do this and that. And you could never live like that for very long, but it's fun to do it for three or four days a year and, and meet people, interact, entertain them. I love doing the cartoon voice panels because I get to say, look at all these neat people I know. Look at how wonderful they are. Um, Credit is something that you should always be giving to other people. You shouldn't be spending your life telling people how great you are. If you're great, someone else will do that. If, if, you, if you care about other people and you, you're really imp genuinely impressed with other people, say, look, you look at these great people here. And, and I used to do a lot of panels at the convention where I would interview someone at length and, you know, for their fans to hear. I'm doing at Comic-Con, I'm going to be interviewing Phil Lamar for an hour. He'll be on one of my voice panels, but I'm also going to be interviewing Phil, who I've gotten to know very well over the years, and um, who I actually would like the idea to just talk to for an hour and ask Phil all these questions that, you know, I, I wouldn't sit there. If I had lunch with Phil, I wouldn't sit there and say, so where'd you grow up? You know, what made you want to do cartoons? What happened? How did you get this job? I mean, you're doing the equivalent of that right now. You're asking me questions. And, and you're enjoying the fact that you get to find out stuff. So it's the same thing. You know, you're doing it on a podcast instead of doing it at a convention, but it's the same thing. That's very true. And like you were saying, you know, credit. And, and to us personally, you definitely are great. Like yeah. the stuff that you've done and the stuff that you've contributed to, like we've just, we've grown up on this stuff. We're going to, you know, we're going to pass it on when like, we have children, grandchildren, just like the work that you've contributed to animation, to film, to comic books. There's so much. Okay, that okay. I, I, don't, I don't take compliments well. So th thank you. <laughs> Change the subject. Okay, <laughs> right. I guess one final thing that I will briefly praise and then ask you about is the blog post that you did about your time working on the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show and especially your hand in the original Scrappy-Doo. Um, and I suppose I'm going to link that in the description down below because I would urge everyone watching this to read that, you know, from first line to last line. It's essential reading in terms of the history of Scooby. But I guess if you could possibly give a brief overview of what that whole experience was like, please. Well, the brief overview would be I was writing a lot of different stuff for a lot of different cartoon studios. And there was a period there was I was in favor with several people at the networks. And... Scooby-Doo had been on for, you can figure out how many years before Scrappy came about better than I can. But ABC was thinking, maybe it's run its course. Maybe, now in hindsight, it's silly to think that after that many few years, Scooby was, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be vulnerable. It comes back every 20 weeks with a new format and a new slant on it, a new version of it. But back then, ABC was saying, ah, maybe we'll retire it. And I had written a pilot for another studio that looked like it was going to go on in Scooby's old time slot. They were going to buy the new show. So Joe Barbera didn't want to give up on it. And he called the staff together and they spent a couple of weeks figuring out how to freshen the show up by adding a new element. And they, not I, they came up with Scrappy Doo, but they weren't really focused on what he was and how he functioned and such. 
there were a lot of different agreements there. And they wrote a script and the network didn't like it. And they wrote another script that the network didn't like it. I don't know how many scripts they wrote. And finally, there was an agent. Um, Hanna-Barbera was, its selling was done a lot by an agent named, this agency was called the Cy Fisher Agency. And the, an agent of the Cy Fisher Agency said to the people at ABC, come on, what do we have to do to get this show bought? The, this, the new version was scrappy doing it. And the lady there said, another writing seems to catch on to anything. That I was say, you know, maybe Mark Evanier could do something with it. So I was, I was working for the studio at the time on Richie Rich, but they had, they didn't, my contract was just Richie Rich. They, they had to hire me to write scrappy do. And we had a huge fight over the money on that and such. But finally I wrote the pilot consulting with Joe Barbera and they, and the network picked up the show. And the episode that I wrote was a script called The Scarab Lives, which kind of took some elements from an episode of the comic book I did for Gold Key. I just kind of plagiarized myself a tiny bit. And uh, it caused ABC to pick up the show for another 13 or 16 weeks. And people can say to me, so you created Scrappy-Doo? I go, no, no, they handed me Scrappy-Doo and said, just figure out how to make the character work. Come up, So we, we understand by reading the script how he will function in the other episodes. So that's what I did. That's really interesting. And another interesting but really shocking part of the blog is when you mentioned about how an executive tried to give their son partial credit on one of your scripts and how oh, yes, yes. the show that's covered by the Writers Guild of America wouldn't have allowed that. So in your experience, have problems like this in non-union shows improved over the years or have they possibly gotten a bit worse? Um, I'm not in the trenches enough to, to, to answer that question. I would tend to think there's less of it nowadays because there's better lawyers around who paying attention to this stuff and because i think people got a sense of ethics about it writers weren't treated all that wonderfully for a period there and the writers have kind of come to the forefront a lot and being important in the way they weren't before so i think there's less of it now but you know in every venue there's always somebody who's trying to cheat somebody out of something yeah that's a good point and like We've kind of got a bit of a, had a bit of an insight into the Writers Guild of America. We spoke to David A. Goodman a number of weeks ago, who was president of the Writers Guild of America for quite quite a few years. And it almost sounds like the ideal would be for one day for all of the shows to be covered by the Writers Guild of America. Is that something that is even a little bit possible at any point in the future? I, I, I spent a couple of years of my life fighting for that. Um, it, it, learning about labor laws and petitions and and I lost a lot of jobs because of it. Studios didn't, I thought I was a troublemaker. Um, there ought to be a minimum standard deal. Um, it, it is to the advantage of the producers to do that. And most of them know it, but there's, you know, what happens is there's a lot of short, ter short term thinking. Uh, in a lot of these studios, they're executives who don't expect to be there in three years. All they want to do is make the show as profitable as possible now so they can get a re contract renewal. And they don't care if they hurt the product that much or if they create new problems down the line. Um, and I, 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 this is getting way off the subjects we've been talking about. So I'll just say that uh, I think the industry would be in better shape if the, if, if, the animation union had turned loose of the writers, which they didn't want to do because we paid a lot of dues and gave them some clout, and the writers still had taken them over. I think the industry would be better off. I think the, the producers would be better off. I think certainly the writers would be better off. Um, I had I worked in cartoons an awful lot for years. I still do some of them. I had a couple of producers who just plain cheated me on, on different ways, and I didn't work for them again. And who knows, I might've been able to sell their show or something that they couldn't sell. They lost me to try to save a thousand dollars, which is not necessarily cost effective. Um, so my answer to your question, Jay, is yeah, I want to, to uh, I'd love to see, you know, the, the Writers Guild cover all cartoons, um, but it's a battle that I fought for a long time and now others have to fight it. I've, I've done my time. Oh God, it's just, yeah, like you say, it's just, it's shocking because it seems to be like it would be so mutually beneficial, you know, with David A. Goodman and Rick Cop 
creating the Hex Girls, who have then been used in literally the next 30 years of Scooby. So it's just hopefully one day that that improves and and maybe like aspiring writers listening to this show today can can go on to spread that message because it's definitely one that is definitely worth yeah. hearing. And another thing that your blog points out is that a lot of people auditioned for the role of Scrappy, including Frank Welker, which I wasn't aware about yeah. prior to reading that blog. So were you present for all of the auditions? No, no, I wasn't. Um, for, well, first of all, I, I wouldn't want to be present for, you know, 80 auditions. Uh, but secondly, um, Hannah Barbera had a tendency to move the writers to one side. You know, you get the script and then they, the next thing you know, you're seeing the show on the air. One of the joys of my career in animation was on the Garfield show. I was involved in all the processes. I, I was voice directing the show. I was writing it. I was supervising parts of it. Um, and I wasn't just shut it aside after they got what they wanted out of me. And I, on Scooby-Doo, you know, I never, I never saw the episodes I wrote until they aired. I never saw a, a minute of them. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't invited to the recording sessions. And, you know, if I'd been there, I might have said, hey, there's a different way to read that line. Maybe it might be funnier this way. But, um, you know, you have – doing a cartoon show is – dealing with it with committees there's lots of people involved and some of them are very good even the intelligent ones can disagree about stuff at times so um you know i i don't expect sometimes to i don't expect to get my way all the time certainly um and uh I forget the question you were asking. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what question was I just answering? It was just about um, how present or not you were within the auditions for the role oh, of Scrappy Day. I, I was not present for most of the auditions. They, they did ask me for advice. Um, I suggested a couple of people. The one who I think they should have, should have hired was Howie Morris. His audition was wonderful. He was very funny. He was, the, he was a great actor, and I became very close to him on the Garfield show. Um, but I recommended a few people and they listened to him and they said, oh, he's great. He's terrific. And then somebody else said, no, they're not. We want somebody else. And, you know, they went through the whole first season with Lenny Weiner, but scrappy. And then they scrapped Lenny. <laughs> you, as you just mentioned with Lenny, that actually brings me on to my next question, which is, um, you, uh, in your blog post, you mentioned how Lenny didn't have the best working relationship with voice director Gordon Hunt, and so you were assigned as the new voice director. So when Lenny was replaced by Don Mezek, did this also mean that you lost out on the voice director role, well, or did well, that continue? I, I never did the voice directing on any Scooby's. What happened was that Lenny, Lenny was a very wonderful guy and a very good actor, and he went through a period when he was having some problems in his personal life and he was a little hard to work with and a little impatient with people and when it came time for to a second season of scrappy do um he had been fighting with gordon hunt now gordon was a thorough professional there was nobody nicer in the animation business than gordon hunt and more competent at his job uh, one of the reasons i didn't fight harder to go to the recording sessions was they didn't need me if gordon was there uh, and, I, and a lot of what I learned about directing cartoon voices, I learned watching Gordon because he was the master of this. Uh, but Lenny and he weren't getting along, and I, I wasn't taking sides in that. And finally, Lenny said, I want a different director. And Bill Hanna said, um, you know, who do you want? And he said, how about Mark Evanier? He could direct these. And they called me in and said, you know, are you willing to do this? And I said, well, it's I, not if, unless Gordon Hunt is okay with it because Gordon had a contract to direct all the shows. And they said, well, go ask him. And I went down to Gordon's office and I said, how would you feel if they hired me to direct the Scooby-Doo's? And he said, please take them away. I can't deal with Lenny anymore. So for a day or two, I was going to be the director of that season of shows and Lenny was going to still be scrappy. But then simultaneously, they figured out that they couldn't deduct what they had to pay me from Gordon's salary. So, th so it was going to cost them more money. And secondly, Lenny was asking still for a lot more money. And Lenny was making demands. And they finally decided they didn't want to put up with Lenny anymore. And so Don Messick became scrappy. And I never was, I never recorded anything at Hanna Barbera. I never did anything at Hanna Barbera. So, um, and Lenny was 
very mad about that and a few other things. And eventually Lenny moved to Chile. He passed, sold his house. He sold his, his beautiful green Rolls Royce he had. And he moved to Chile and retired. Oh. Thank you for explaining all that and like clarifying. And it's kind of a little bit shocking that he sold everything and went to Chile. Well, people, people do that sometimes. Lenny was in love with a woman who wanted to live in Chile. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know anything much about you, Rihanna, but one, one day you might meet someone who wants, you know, or, or have somebody in your life that you want to change your life with. Um, Lenny had, was phenomenally successful as a voice actor. He made tons of money. Um, Lenny, at one point, was a very popular on-camera actor. You may remember him playing Magic Mongo on a show for Sid and Marty Croft. You may remember him. Uh, did you ever see, you ever see the Dick Van Dyke show? Did they rerun them where you are? Yes. yes. There's, there's three episodes of that show Lenny is in, and he's brilliant. He is so wonderful in those shows. If he had kept doing that kind of work, there might have been the Lenny Weinrib show on the air. He might have been a big star of his own show. But Lenny was making so much money doing voiceovers that he um, neglected his on-camera career. And I think later he may have been a little sorry for that. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you go for the money or you go for, or, and, he, and he didn't, wasn't doing stand up just uh, doing a voiceover just for the money. He really genuinely enjoyed it. He was, and he was good at it. Um, and, you know, it, it, and, you know, like Lenny popped up everywhere. If you were, if you were watching TV or going to movies in this country in the 60s, did you ever, any, either you ever see my favorite movie? It's called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. I don't believe seen, I have. I may oh. know it, but don't know. The well, title. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm never speaking to either of you again, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a very funny movie. It's like a three and a half hour movie with every major, com not everyone, but, but 50 of the greatest comedians of the world are in that movie. Milton Burroughs, Sid Caesar, Phil Silvers, all these people. The Three Stooges get the biggest laugh at it without saying a word. And I Lenny's. That Lenny's wine room's voices in a few places in the movie, dubbing other, dubbing voices in. And I, and I, you know, and then I became friends with Lenny because I worked a lot for Sid and Marty Croft and Lenny did a lot of voices. He was the voice of H.R. Puff and stuff, for instance. Um, and I loved Lenny. He was a great guy. Uh, but in this world, you, you know, your, your careers and lives go in different ways. You may, the direction you may be going in when you're 40 may not be where you're going when you're 60. And Lenny decided he was better off in Chile. Fine, it's, it's not for me to judge. He used to phone me from Chile and he was just so happy to be there. And we would talk for an hour. Sometimes he was, he was paying. Uh, <laughs> I think the internet made it real cheap to, to call from Chile, but um, he didn't miss it. He would loved doing voiceover. He was spectacular at it, but he didn't miss it once he left it because other things having to do with his family and his hobbies and things took its place. You know, there are there are people who retire when they have successful careers. They retire, and there are people who would never retire. June Foray worked until the day she couldn't work anymore. She did not retire ever retire. If you said if you said to her, "What June are you going to retire?" She went, "What's that? Why would I do that?" Because uh, she loved what she did. But you know, you can also love something else. Yeah. That's so true. And life has crazy ways of, you know, changing, giving you like twists and turns along the line. And yeah, if you asked me like two years ago, I would never have expected to have met like JB and Millie. And I was very adamant I didn't want anything to do with creating a YouTube channel and things like that. And now I'm part of this amazing, you know, channel with I, who I call my best friends. So it definitely has crazy ways of like changing your life sometimes for the better. And I know for me, it definitely was for the better. And it sounds like for Lenny, it definitely was as well. R Rihanna, are you, forgive me for asking this, do you have a career goal in mind? I do. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually training to be a WWE commentator and an actor. Okay. You, well, from what I see here, you got a good start at it. You're real good. You're, you're, a, good interview, you're a good interviewer. And, and uh, that's one of the great things the internet has done. It's given people a chance to, to start in the small jobs where you you know you where you can where, where you if you where you can be lousy if you have to be you have you're not lousy maybe you were lousy a few years ago but you're not lousy now so um 
you know, it's it's uh, it's, a, it's a very new world, and, and things have changed. And I look back, and very few of the people I knew at Hanna Barbera are still around. Um, I talked to you know Jerry Eisenberg occasionally, and to Floyd Norman, and to Willie Ito, and people like that, and some of the writers. But uh, you know, most of the voice people have passed away that I do would love back then. Um, and the world changes. The Hanna Barbera building that I worked in is now a gymnasium, uh, and uh, it's a 3400 Coinga Boulevard. And you just have you just things change, and you ha and the world changes, and the rules change with them. So um, it's fun for me to sit here and talk about the way things were in the 70s, but they're not that way now. No, it, in some ways it's a bit unfortunate because there's some parts of you know the 70s and you know, 70s, 80s that were just so amazing that people have lost touch with reality in some ways nowadays. But, yeah. you know, speaking of like how time has changed, we recently celebrated the 20th anniversary of the 2002 Scooby-Doo live action movie. And were you, because you were such great friends with Lenny, did you ever know if he auditioned or possibly was approached for um, voicing Scrappy-Doo in the movie? Uh, I'm sure he was not. I, I don't remember the timing of when Lenny passed and, and when his health got bad, but he was, in, I think he was in Chile by the time they made that movie. And Lenny loves Scrappy Doo. He wouldn't have wanted to make fun of him. Uh, he, Lenny call, used to call me from Chile. He got very into the internet being away from show business. That was his lifeline to it. And he'd call me up pretty soft and he'd say, did you read this thing online where someone said they don't like Scrappy Doo? And I go, no, I didn't. There's, you know, the internet's a big place, Lenny. I don't see the same page as you see. And he, he was very hurt by some of the messages he saw posted because he was very proud of that character. As he was proud of all his work. And uh, people were mocking Scrappy. Uh, not a lot of them, but they were very loud people. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's definitely a very vocal community. I know that I myself, I'm quite, I like a Scrappy a lot. I've got a Scrappy here. Um, and at the end of the day, Scrappy did save the show, as you quite well reiterated yeah. within within your blog. So it's it's it is as you take it, really. You know. Well, you know, it's 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 easy to take cheap shots at some things in this world. So um, no, I was proud of Scrappy. I mean, the role I, what small part I played in the role of getting him on there. Uh, he saved the show. That was my goal. I was not being. I was hired to write something that ABC would buy. And that was the sole criteria. Joe Barbera didn't have to like what I write as long as ABC picked up the show. And Joe Barbera did not like everything Hannah Barbera produced. No, nobody could. But uh, there was reasons for trying to get it picked up. I had people who worked on this, this next season who thanked me because I had helped them not lose their jobs. That's a, that's a nice thing to do. Definitely. And I guess my final question before I throw it over to JB to wrap up with the final two questions. Um, with your blog, you, de um, you detail, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm really sorry. My brain just, it's really hot here in England and uh, I think uh, the heat's going too slightly. <laughs> mine went away in 1987. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> so, um, your blog details a lot that it was quite hectic working on Scooby-Doo from the books to the series and everything. But do you have a favorite memory from working on either the series or the books? Um, well, that story I told you about how it popped up in my life when I didn't expect it is probably my favorite story. It's like, you know, some cosmic force went, no, no, you must write Scooby-Doo. We'll rearrange all this stuff so it's there for you again. Um, but I, you know, the, uh, one of the things I, opinions I have of Scooby-Doo and you folks may, and people watching this may disagree. I think it's hard to be a fan of Scooby-Doo if you only watch it every so often. I think you have to watch it a lot because it, as a body of work, it's not any individual episode. It's the, it's, the, it's the way those characters behave over a whole series of things. I, I don't really like watching one Scooby-Doo. I used to like watching occasionally when a channel, cable channel when like six episodes back to back and I could have them on and watch them. I think, I think the show, um, I'm sure there's a point of diminishing returns, but it's kind of fun to see 
these people doing new things each episode and 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 the way in which you just feel like they're your old buddies. And look, Scooby and Scrappy are on again. Shaggy, there's Shaggy again. You know, it's 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 like that. Uh, so I don't have a specific favorite episode. I didn't do that many Scooby Doo's in the comic books. I did a lot of those, but uh, you know, you 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 can pride yourself on an individual episode. You can pride yourself on a body of work. Look at the standard I. I achieved over these, you know, two years or something. So I'm, I'm not evading your question. I just don't have a better answer. No, that's okay. It was perfect. Understandable. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I guess to switch up the scene a bit, as, as we prepare to wrap up, you know, we've spoken a lot about the past during this interview today, but moving on to the present and the future, is there anything that you have currently or upcoming that you're excited to talk about? Um, not really. I've, we're, you know, it's no secret we're trying to develop Gru as a cartoon show, the comic book I do with Sergio Aragonis. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on these reprints of the Pogo newspaper strip, which I'm very proud of. It's a wonderful book. And I can say that because it's wonderful because of stuff I didn't do. Uh, but uh, I'm writing a few prose things now. I'm writing a novel. I'm writing a screenplay. Uh, I don't like to talk about stuff until it's got a good chance of coming out. No, that's understandable. Yeah. But I guess in terms of keeping up with the progress of those things and keeping up with your work in general, is there any specific thing that you'd like us to include in the description for people to follow? Oh, just say he's the guy who did all that silly stuff. That's all. You can mention Garfield. People seem to like that. Oh, well, thank you so much for the time that you've given us today. I'm, I'm glad to do it. I, I, I like the fact that you folks... Uh, um, have this enthusiasm for this material. And you remember what I was saying earlier about how great it is to, to show how good other people are, you know, to, to show other people. Jay, you did that by showing me how good Rihanna is. Oh, you let her, you just let her, her go for a long period of time. And she met the challenge of keeping the interview alive and going. So you, you did, you did that kind of thing. I like of letting someone else look good. Not that she already isn't good, but you know, yeah, no, that's understandable. That's that's why I love to do these interviews because it's like a medium, like maybe people watching this can just use me as a mouthpiece to let so many great people, including the host that we always have on, just do their thing and put it out to the world for people to enjoy. Aside from Frank Welker, who would you most like to get on this podcast? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, Matthew Lillard would be amazing considering the legacy for our Shaggy now. That would be incredible. Um Goodness. Mindy Cone. Mindy Cone would be amazing. Um, I guess Patrick Warburton, for all the, the only yeah. one that you said that only has like one one kind of distinct voice, I think their work throughout the Mystery Incorporated series kind of does a lot to characterize and flesh out the world of Crystal Cove. That's quite good. Okay. Well, you'll get eventually, if you keep, if you're just, if you're polite and keep asking, eventually you'll get most of those people. So JB yeah. always works his magic because without like JB, uh, we wouldn't have a channel and none of us uh, are like I'm, no I'm else knows how to the edit. Resident, I'm the <laughs> resident schmuck. That's that's my role in all of this. I'm the <laughs> resident schmuck, to be quite honest. But you know, you've been so generous of your time today. Um, and I guess just for the sake of wrapping things up to everyone listening, thank you so much for listening to another interview today. It's very nice to see people keeping up with these week by week and leaving their feedback. It's amazing to see. So if you do want to see more of this, then please make sure to subscribe to the channel and also to follow Rihanna's social links in the description down below, because there's sure to be some amazing things there soon. So for this and so much more, then please like, comment and subscribe to JBM Millie, and we'll see you next time.